There are two main places where we store our memories. Most of our memories are stored in our long-term memory. In this video, however, we're going to be focusing on the short-term memory storage. Now, this storage has limits and in some cases can actually be destroyed. If you want to learn the basics on short-term memory, I'm here to explain to you how we store and process memories, as well as the ways that we can improve our ability to remember information. So first off, short-term memory is very important because it holds information between sensory memory and long-term memory. So for example, we might see a phone number on a piece of paper. It stays inside our iconic memory or visual memory, which is a form of sensory memory for less than four seconds until it gets transferred to our short-term memory if we pay attention to it. That way we can do stuff with it, like tell it to another person or write it down before it fades away. Then, if it's important enough to us, or if we have an emotional attachment to it, we will store that phone number in our long-term memory. See, you wouldn't want everything that's in your sensory memory going straight to long-term memory, or you just run out of space to store it all. So in a sense, short-term memory gives us a buffer to decide if we want to keep information for good or to forget about it by choosing to give it attention and effort. Secondly, let's get to the technical definition. Short-term memory refers to the ability to hold a small amount of information in your mind for a short period of time. Now, there are two important qualities of short-term memory is that you can't manipulate the information, unlike working memory, which is something I'll talk about in another video, and it has a very limited duration. Our short-term memory storage goes through a lot of disposal. We can only remember things for so long. But how much of that information can you store in your short-term memory, and how long will this information last? Well, the exact numbers differ for everyone, but research on short-term memory has given us a good estimate of the average duration and capacity of short-term memory storage. Let's start with capacity. In the world of psychology, the magic number of items that you can store in your short-term memory is seven plus or minus two. Now this magic number is based off of a paper written by American psychologist George Miller, and it has been studied so much that we basically accept it as true. Now there are ways to hack this capacity, but we'll get to that soon. If you're curious, you can actually test your own short-term memory capacity using my free memory test at the end of this video. Secondly, the duration. You can only keep seven plus or minus two items in your head for so long. If you make no effort to remember these items, they'll quickly disappear in a matter of seconds. You can, however, stretch this duration out to 30 seconds if you actively rehearse and repeat the items in your head. However, many psychologists do say that technically you're just remembering what you last said instead of remembering what you initially said. So now that we know the capacity and the duration, let's get on to some theories of forgetting. Well, why do we forget? Why do pieces of information leave our short-term memory after a period of time? One of the explanations is the decay theory, also called the trace decay theory of forgetting. The theory is relatively simple. It states that memories decay over time. When the memory is initially created, it leaves a trace of chemical changes in our brain. And as time passes, that trace fades away. On one hand, this theory is perfectly sensible. We're more likely to remember a phone number told to us two minutes ago than a phone number that was told to us two weeks ago. We're likely to remember what we ate yesterday, but less likely to recall what we ate on a specific date four years ago. In most cases, however. On the other hand, this theory has been disputed, partly because people do have such strong memories of certain dates in their lives. People may recall significant or insignificant pieces of information from a long time ago, and we just don't know why. Not all memories fade away. According to this theory, if you don't want the information to fade away, you just have to relearn it. This graph shows how much of a list is retained during each relearning period. It makes sense, right? We have no need to remember something if we don't use it often. However, the more that we use it, the more it would make sense to try to remember it. In fact, relearning is the first way we can remember things better. As you see in this graph, each time we try to relearn something, the rate at which we forget is less and less. This is why studying for a test works so well. You're basically just relearning the information. In short, this theory of forgetting is called the decay theory. But let's move on to another theory. Let's say you might remember what you had for breakfast yesterday, but not what you had for breakfast two years ago. There's a lot that happened in your short-term memory between two years ago and yesterday. You had over 600 breakfasts, 600 lunches, 600 dinners. You were asked to remember phone numbers and study for tests and make mental notes of your friend's birthdays. Even if you tried your hardest to remember what you had for breakfast on a specific date, there are so many things that distracted you and your memory, and it was just never stored long-term. Now this is another theory that tries to explain why we forget things. We simply displace previous memories with newer memories. In a study by Glanzier and Kunins, researchers gave participants a list of information to memorize. 
The participants were separated into two groups. The first group recalled the items immediately. However, the second group was given a distraction task to complete for a few seconds before also being asked to recall the information. Now, the results from both of these groups supported the serial position effect. The information at the beginning and the end was more likely to be recalled by participants. However, the group that completed the distraction task were much less likely to recall the items at the end of the list. Psychologists figure that those items were stored in short-term memory, but with the distractions, they were displaced quickly. The distraction task displaced all of the original list. This theory of forgetting is called the displacement theory. Now, we can't talk about short-term memory storage without talking about our favorite fish that doesn't have short-term memory. Yes, I'm talking about Dory. Dory's most unique characteristic was her inability to hold on to information for more than a few seconds. Now, while it's funny during the movie, it has led many people to wonder, is short-term memory loss a real condition? And it is. The technical name for it is anterograde amnesia. Now, anterograde amnesia is a condition in which people develop a partial or a complete inability to recall their recent past. Memories are created, but often immediately forgotten or decayed. Even after just five seconds, a person with anterograde amnesia cannot recall something that was just said to them. Someone with this type of amnesia can remember things from their childhood, but are unlikely to remember things that happened to them after they were diagnosed with anterograde amnesia. So how do you actually develop this? Well, there are a few ways. Two temporary forms of anterograde amnesia are caused by benzodiazepine drugs or too much alcohol, also known as a blackout. A semi-permanent form of anterograde amnesia is caused by certain emotional disorders. While permanent anterograde amnesia can be caused by traumatic brain injuries or certain illnesses that cause neurological deterioration. So moving on, after simply relearning information, how else can we remember things more often? How can we make better use of our short-term memory? Well, we can use something called chunking. So you now know that short-term memory storage is limited. The brain can only keep five to nine items in your short-term memory at a time, but there is a way to hack this limit and retain a little bit more information in your short-term memory for just a longer period of time. And this hack is called chunking. Chunking just requires that you chunk multiple pieces of information together to form a single group of items to remember. So while the brain can only store five to nine pieces of individual information, research shows that you can store up to four chunks of information. And if each chunk has four pieces of information to it, you can hack your way to recalling 16 things that you need to remember. Now, one of the most common examples of chunking is memorizing phone numbers. Memorizing 10 individual numbers at a time is no easy task, but when you separate things into three chunks, like the area code, the first three numbers, and the last four numbers, remembering the phone number is entirely possible. Now, chunking can actually be used alongside other memory hacks to expand your ability to store more items in your short-term memory. In fact, the word mnemonic actually means memory device, and I have a whole article and a video on those, but here's a quick rundown. You can use an acronym like Roy G. Biv to remember the colors of the rainbow. You could use an acrostic, like my very educated mother just served us nine pizzas, to help you remember the order of the planets from the sun. You could also use a mind palace, which is made famous from the Sherlock Holmes series. And there are a few other mnemonics, but you'll just have to watch that other video. Now, as I end this video, I want to let you know that I'm very excited about a memory quiz that I just created. It tests your long-term, short-term, and your working memory in less than five minutes. And if you'd like to participate and see how you compare to other people around the world, there's a link in the description so that you can take that quiz absolutely free. I was actually just going to put a link to one, but I couldn't find any good ones. So what I did was I outlined a single quiz that would test all three forms of basic memory, and I'm super excited to see what you guys think of it. I believe this test will help people better understand the differences between short-term working and long-term memory. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you in the next video.